Hello and welcome to Kicking Tires. My name is Jimmy. And I'm Justin. And today is January 5th and uh, just want to say Happy New Year to everyone. It's been a little bit of a break that we took because it was Christmas and all that good stuff. But we're back. Season 2, I guess you can kind of call it. But nice. we got some <laughs> we got some amazing news this week because it is CES, a lot of EV stuff. Chevy dropped, of course, the Silverado, which we're going to go in-depth over. There's the Equinox EV that they dropped a little bit of information about. Uh, BMW has their information on the iX, especially the M60 variant, which is pretty interesting. Chrysler, remember that brand? Anyways, they're back with the Airflow concept. And Sony has dropped off information of their Vision S2. But let's talk about what we uh, are here to talk about first is the Equinox. Mm. The Equinox is, of course... Well, I'm going to hide this. Uh, oh, I totally hit the wrong thing. Oh, hide. Oh, there we go. Much better. Uh, the Equinox is Chevy's small SUV. Small. You don't. Small. CRV RAV4 size. So, yeah. Not that small, but yeah. S- small ish. They make you- a lot of way bigger SUV so it is pretty small in their lineup the yeah. so the Equinox like the only time that you see them is like at Enterprise or budget rent a car you yeah know? that's really the only time that you see them because they're they're inexpensive vehicles for fleets to to capture on and yeah. they're just I mean they're they're an they're an SUV but it's not one that like a lot Never of people buy particularly captivating, uh, especially here in Canada. In the states, they actually sell a decent amount of them, uh, but Canada is not that popular. I remember seeing a lot when the Olympics were here. There was the mm. Olymp, yeah, the white ones. They had the special uh, edition, and all the uh, athletes would get driven around in equinoxes, um, which we saw every now and then. But in the states, they do sell like. I don't know, a quarter of a million of these a year. So it's it's actually reasonably popular vehicle because it is a, a good segment to be in. It's just that they don't really have a compelling product. Actually, none of the domestics really have a compelling product, I think. I think the Escape is not that interesting either. No, it's not. Uh, the, the Bronco Sport is kind of cool, though, uh, obviously. But uh, yeah, no, has Chrysler has nothing. So... Yeah, so the the big three. But Buick has something that's amazing. Buick does. Buick does, and uh, I already forgot the name of it, but <laughs> they do. Envision. Yeah, but but that is slightly, very slightly upmarket. It is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think one of the issues with the Equinox, uh, the current one at least, uh, is the pricing just doesn't make that much sense. I think they've always banked on like offering like a fat discount on these cars because you you go you go look at a RAV4 CRV even a Nissan Rogue you're not really going to get any discount but uh, Equinox they always had like like better manufacturer rebates so but if you were to just look at it on sticker price it wouldn't make any sense like why would anyone buy an Equinox Uh, but dealer network is another big thing GM has a huge dealer network in North America so uh, it's popular for that reason too because there's places where you can't buy a a nissan rogue but you can find an equinox yeah so this ev version there's really not a lot of details it's going to come in 2024 um should be about 30k to start so 30k to maybe mid 40s it's uh what i'm basically thinking ultimum ultium platform which is gm's like ev platform that they're going to use across the entire line um i'm, I'm kind of thinking like this is basically it just a uh, jumped up a little bit bolt right mm-hmm. so it's going to have four-wheel drive because they kind of need it in this market mm-hmm. uh, but it's going to be roughly the same as that and i don't think that's going to be a bad problem you know other than maybe potential some fire issues uh but the equinox itself it looks good you know, the renders yeah. on it, it, it actually looks like a sporty little SUV. But the problem with that is 
I don't know if you remember when the Blazer, not the old one, the current Blazer, when the renderings came out for that, it looked really good. It looked really promising. Uh, and then the car came out. It still looked really good. And then the specs came out. Then everything kind of went downhill from there. Well, so, the big problem with the Blazer, I think it looks good on the outside. It's priced a little bit too high. And they were trying to incorporate, they were trying to embody the Camaro. But yeah. what they did is they took the worst parts of the Camaro, which is the new grill from the facelift, which is 2019 and up. And they took the interior off of the Camaro, which is terrible, but it's fine in a Camaro. Camaro will still sell, but in a crossover, a mid-size crossover, it doesn't, you can't have a crappy interior. And that has easily the worst interior in the segment. I don't know, um, at least in my opinion. The the vent controls were awesome. Just a <laughs> huge dial that you turn the... Uh... Except the vents were by your knees. <laughs> well, sometimes your knees are cold and you want to warm up your knees. It's just your kneecap, right? Like, that's yeah. the only thing. Yeah. So, but this really... one looks a lot better. And I, it... I really like that they've carried a lot of that GM design, well, Chevy specifically design language, over from cars like that Bolt EUV that we saw a few months ago. Um, but I, I think that having that identity is important because especially moving on to our next topic, it is you see the same lineage there, which is really solid. Uh, yeah. You know, it doesn't really look like any Chevy from... 10 years ago and maybe that's a good thing yeah so the next topic is the all new all electric silverado yeah it's a 2024 huge. model it's coming in fall of 2023 for the uh, rst version there's going to be the work truck version that's going to be coming a little bit earlier pricing for the work truck they say it's estimated about forty thousand us um, for this RST, it's 105. So it's that is not... kind of mind boggling that the, it... the range is that big. Yeah. I mean, truck ranges has always been huge, right? Yeah. Like if you look like, you know, F-150, what's an XL single cab short bed price versus yeah, like layering, 30K everything, right? versus 100K. Yeah. Yeah. So like the, the price range isn't... <sighs> I'm just thinking, this is an RST. Uh, as we talked um, beforehand, RST isn't the top trip, right? RST is kind of middle. Yeah. So at 105 for one. Yeah. So 105 for the RST, how much more is the high country going to be? Yeah. Well, okay. There's got to be trims in between. And so. If we're talking about 40k US starting price for the work truck, which is still going to have, I assume, dual motors and same towing. Yeah, so they say it's same range. So, so still same 400 same, mile range. Same base platform. Then there's going to be models uh, kind of in between that will make more sense. Let's say you take the work, because the work truck is pretty bare bones. But let's say you add 10, 15k on top of that and you get something... Similar to, I don't know, what uh, uh, LT uh, that we have with the regular Silverado or yep. maybe comparable to an XLT over at Ford. Um, and then you have something that kind of makes sense. I think around that 55, 60K price point. I'm not sure why the RST is this much, but maybe a lot of these features are only RST exclusive because the mid gate, is is really sweet but i'm sure that costs a decent amount of money i don't know if they're all gonna have it um, yeah they they weren't specific on the uh the mid gate itself the multi-pro tailgate that it's going to be an rst exclusive the work truck will mm -hmm. not get that um but like okay let's let's talk about all the the the, the facts of the vehicle first here so it's up to 660 horsepower, 780 pound-feet of torque. That's on wide open watts mode, wow mode. Love love the name. Um, zero to 60, four and a half seconds. There's a DC fast charge. I think it was 350 kilowatt uh, hour, which means it's one of the fastest. Only, of course, you can get those speeds. You really can't find those type of chargers. But if you can, 
is 100 miles in about 10 minutes, which is actually pretty good. Uh, 10,000 pound towing capacity. There's going to be a work truck in the future that's going to have 20,000 pounds. That's I, I, that that's boggles insane my mind. In, a, in what's like a half ton size. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how they're going to do it, and I'm not sure how much that's going to affect range. Uh, I don't know if that electric truck would be affected less by towing or more because they have a lot of torque on on hand you don't have to work hard for that torque so i don't know if it it takes less of a hit because i know sometimes you're towing uh with you know an eco boost or even a 5.3 silverado your fuel economy goes up quite significantly with a 6,000 pound trailer right yeah. um what's interesting is the bed is a 511 so it's almost six foot bed um and unlike ford's lightning this is like a completely new platform it's not like they took the silverado they made it electric which is exactly what ford did with the lightning mm. this is a completely new platform so it's th through and through it's it's actually very thoughtful very very short front overhang um, which means the front is definitely going to be smaller than f-150 but i actually don't mind that because yeah. it it means it's a that, pickup truck at the end of the day. Yeah, it moves everything forward. You get bigger cabin, you got bigger space on the inside, and you get a longer, bigger bed in the back. Yeah, and, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and because it's you a, can see it. Yeah, and because of the unit body kind of setup, you have that multi flex mid gate, and like that's hundred percent avalanche, right? You're able yeah. to take that middle partition out and extend you know your your bed size you get it up just to makes 10, so much sense yeah you get up to 10 feet yeah. before the 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 stopper at the end so like if you have a large couch you can take it all within you know the as long the, as it fits in the, the height vehicle. yeah yeah and you can't get that out of any van or or full-size pickup truck not even a heavy duty to have that much length i don't know why more trucks don't offer it avalanche did it 20 years ago and it's still like one of these really sweet features that for some reason everyone just abandoned it all we care about now with trucks is i don't know like fancy touch screens that's kind, kind of all everyone cares about. and then like cool off-road you know looks but uh no i think it's it's pretty cool that gm is bringing this back and they they kind of brought it to the mainstream not that long ago. And it's one of their better ideas. It's not like the the Envoy XUT or, or their, their Hummer trucks, like the H3T, which, you know, you don't have that much bed space realistically. But this is this is a big opening. Uh, it's a big square opening comparable to, you know, a, a regular crossover at least. Yeah, uh, it's just a rent like a, a square, uh, and it's open to the back. So you guys got to see pictures of this. It is really a feature that makes a lot of sense. That is not EV exclusive. Like that. That's the thing is that there's yeah. no reason only the the Silverado EV the gets Subaru this. Baja had this. <laughs> Subaru Baja needed this, so, but that's only a pass through though. It, it was a very small pass-through just on the bottom. The glass couldn't be taken out. This, you can take out the glass, and yeah. the bottom can split 60-40. That's the important part. Splitting yeah. it 60-40 makes it so much more useful. The ability to still have four people within the cabin and take something that's like 8, 9, 10 feet with you, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah, and I'm also thinking if you put a canopy over this for camping, Ooh. that would be sick. Yeah. Because you have a basically six foot bed now turned into 11 feet. Like there's so much storage in there. The, you know, the Rivian, that, that thing's party piece was that slide out tray that you have to pay extra for, which to me, it's not, it's kind of like a tour bus, how you have a pass through in the mm -hmm. middle. To me, it doesn't do that much. And it's, it seems kind of awkward to use um but it's kind of modular so maybe people will 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 upfit that to do other camping things but in terms of just space uh and practicality this seems 
really promising. They have some renderings with uh, a canopy on top. It's slightly taller than the cab itself. Uh, that's going to be nice for camping, I think. And yeah, to pass through everything, it just kind of keeps it all in one. Uh, and if you can like the RAV4 that I took camping, if you can run a, the car as an electric heater with very low energy, it's maybe worth considering too, because it's all electric heaters. It's not like a, a gasoline car where it's wasting all this energy to, to run the heat. Uh, electric vehicles just don't need that. So maybe there's some kind of solar integration. I think, I think the outdoors community uh, is going to benefit from this truck. Yeah. yeah. So that's mainly the RST. So like the the one that's kind of higher more for, end. yeah, the higher end every man kind of truck. Uh, but they also released the work truck, the WT, and like. I'm going through these pictures and I, I don't know about you, but I actually kind of like the work truck a little bit more. It's just more truckish to me, right? Yeah, it has those traditional truck qualities. Uh, really simple interior, yeah. which makes sense on the EV anyways. And like the outside, it's plastic bumpers, which I actually kind of like more. Um, it has steel wheels, which I don't mind because... You know, you're going to put something aftermarket on it anyways. Uh, they say it's going to have the same range and, you know, it has all the same capabilities. It's like, why not get the work truck? The interior is going to be a little bit more rough and ready. That's great for outdoorsy types. You know, you want to get the truck a little bit more dirty. It's going to be perfect for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fender flares are plastic. Um, the front bumper is plastic up, up to the headlights. So... That is very durable uh, in a sense. And I mean, work trucks, these are trucks that people don't wash for years. <laughs> like <laughs> I've seen, like they're, they're at least on the outside, they are some of the dirtiest vehicles you'll come across. And having it plastic up to like your elbows, <laughs> it's kind of makes sense. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Plastic door handles, plastic mirrors. Uh, yeah. Just it it's so just utilitarian to me. Like I, I absolutely love it. Um like sure I, I appreciate a well loaded truck with like amazing luxurious interiors. I do because like I had a F-150 Lariat, which you know it's not the top trim, but it was up there. Had massaging leather seats and everything. It was it was a great vehicle, it was a great luxury vehicle, but it wasn't I didn't feel like you know, I could get it dirty. I felt bad if I got it dirty. It's too you know? nice. Yeah, it was just a little too too nice. Um, this I feel like I don't mind getting this dirty. I feel like you know if I got this dirty, it it's it's perfect for it's it. It's meant to be that way. Yeah. But anything else you want to talk about the Silverado? Silverado. I don't know. I think you guys just. Make sure you check out pictures of this thing. I think it is it is one of the more important releases. Oh, the naming. Okay, so it's it's called a Silverado. It's not really a Silverado electric. We kind of covered that it doesn't, it's not really the same as the the, the normal gasoline powered or diesel powered pickup truck. Uh, it's a very cab four design. So uh, everything is, oh, they have a trail boss picture. They have one trail boss photo. It looks kind of like work trucky from the front, except with a slightly different bumper, more like aggressive hooks. grill. Yeah, yeah, a real grill somehow. Yeah, uh, and Near all terrain tires, um, very Hummerish. But yeah, this is uh, this is kind of like the more practical version of that Hummer truck. The Hummer truck is a toy, but this is like a little bit more honest and you know realistic of what most consumers will want um and i think they're both winners i think uh the silverado ev is a winner i think the hummer is a winner uh we're gonna see a lot of electric trucks come by uh ford is doing a pretty decent job rivian is doing a decent job at this like there's just 
so much movement in this industry or in this segment specifically. Uh, it's pretty exciting times we're living in. Um, this is going to come about two years left uh, or two, two years to go for this, maybe a year and a half uh, as they keep developing it. But yeah, I'm super excited about it. And okay, another thing is the, the fast charge capability. You know, everyone goes Tesla supercharging, blah, blah, blah. You know, I've, I've called out journalists for hyping up supercharging too much uh, and Tesla owners being also justifying buying their car for that reason too much. But again, this car is coming out in two years, fast charge, 100 miles, 160K basically in 10 minutes. We really don't need anything faster than that. And the infrastructure in two years, again, is going to be very different. And so, yeah, I think forget about Tesla. Like Cybertruck is coming. I know it. But uh, as far as like a work truck, I, I don't think you can really beat GM at their own game. GM and Ford, uh, they've been dominating this industry for half a century and they will continue to do so. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I like how you talked about the Hummer truck because that's basically it's the same kind of the same thing as this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know if you saw, but the Hummer truck is like nine thousand pounds. <laughs> it's it's a heavy boy. I'm curious how heavy this by the, the this big guy is gonna be. Oh, this is gonna be like seven thousand at least. You think so? Yeah, because even. Uh... I think even the the iX like like a full size SUV model X like these are like six thousand pound cars already, mm-hmm. yeah. And this is bigger, yeah. So <laughs> I I to to give you that kind of range, it it's gonna need to be heavy. But here's the thing: is that weight in an EV does not take as big of a toll. One, because of the location, and two, they're already advertising how efficient these cars are. Like, they're they're targeting, you know, big range, so they only make it as heavy as it really needs to be, uh, and they're still able to get insane range out of them. I'm... Because... The reason why I'm thinking about the weight is, like, I'm thinking, you know, when you're off-road, you, you do want Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes you do want a lighter vehicle, right? Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking of a hamper. It's kind of like off-road capabilities. Yeah. Oh, I did notice one thing. The payload is very low on this thing. I oh, think that has to do with the weight. I think I saw a number of like 1,300 pounds or something, which is what we see out of like the Maverick or the, I think maybe even less than the Santa Cruz. But it's like in that very low range of payload. So even though we have a 10 foot length up to, we we don't have that much payload to work with. Mm. Pay, 1,300 pounds is like five fat gals. Like, <laughs> just to put it into perspective, I'm like, huh. Because ultimately your tires and suspension and all this, uh, it can only take so much weight. And I think being an EV, it is going to be heavier. And I think that's why the payload takes that hit. Yeah, because like the half ton trucks are at like are at like two thousand pounds. They're at they're at a ton now, uh, for a lot of the half tons, technically. Um, but yeah, this is the only thing I noticed is the payload is is significantly lower than other half tons of this size. It does have four corner air suspension. Hmm. So, not sure that's adjustable. That... Yeah. I'm not sure if that helps or doesn't. Um, I do really like that illuminated bow tie on the front. Mm-hmm. It's, I, I don't know, when I think Mazda had that illuminated grill on their signature series. I was a sucker for that. Really? I really, I really like that illuminated grill. Man, that Mazda I thought, had. when I saw it, I thought it was aftermarket. When I saw BMW do it, on their X6, I thought it was aftermarket, Oof. like a the tacky X- add-on. X6 was a little too much. 
Yeah. I think the X6 illuminated grill was 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 too much because it was bright. Like it shined on the ground and you can completely see yeah, the grill. It's very line. deep too. Like you can yeah. see like two inches into the grill. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, let's move on. Let's talk about BMW actually. Let's uh let's talk about their iX. So they launched two things. Um uh, well, not really two things. They they talked about the iX flow which uses like e-reader technology to change <laughs> the hue, not the color. They all say color change. It doesn't change color. It goes from black and anything in between to white. All right. It's a hue change. But essentially, the body of the vehicle, same uh, as well as the wheel covers, they can change from <laughs> black to white. So you can have like a gray car, you can have a white car, you can have it kind of like transform in the middle of the day. Like, I think it's cool, but in real world use sense, yeah. Uh, I was I was watching the video of like um, of a BMW spokesperson saying, "Oh, the real world use." It's like, oh, in climates, I can we can change a color to help with you know heat and whatnot so uh, i was like yeah okay okay so like you know it's a little hotter you change it to white to reflect some of that heat if it's colder you change it to black to absorb some of that i i can get that um and then she says <clears throat> you can change you can make a flash so like when you're in a parking lot you can then see your car with your peripheral vision <laughs> i'm i don't know let's see like the the heating thing, I get it. You know that that can potentially help because you know you sat in a a black car in summer. It's it's pretty hot. Uh, but then she goes about changing it so that it flashes, so you can catch it with your peripheral vision. Yeah. I don't. Mm, I don't think so. Yeah, I think the practical applications of this technology doesn't really apply to the car world so much. Uh, but it is it is one of those things where it's like okay we're gonna throw it on here it's gonna be like an experiment it's gonna be an art thing but we it's like that 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 Vanta black mm. uh, X six it's like the blackest black you can black um, and it's not it's not really a car thing but it's just like we're gonna use this to demonstrate it yeah. uh, as our platform you know this is BMW this is their most uh innovative car right now so we're gonna put this on here as a yeah showcase no but, showcase yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but the the one that you probably want to know about the one that actually matters is the ix so they announced the m60 so the yeah. title i love it the best of three words of i x and m yeah <laughs> So, I mean, I get it, right? They combine the M performance side, they combine the I side, which is the electric side, and X, which is like the all-wheel drive side, right? Mm -hmm. So this IX M60 is, it's actually kind of crazy. Was it 619 horsepower, 811 pound-feet of torque, zero to 100 in 3.8 seconds? Yeah, this thing's uh this thing's pretty quick. It's pretty Looks. quick. Fastest, probably their fastest SUV at the moment. Uh is it just me or is this a bad thing that I'm not impressed by these numbers though? It's like we see the lucid and we see the plaids of the world. And it's yeah. like, okay. And that, we like acceleration numbers, power figures, they don't really matter to me anymore. It's just like supercharging it's like it's something for people to talk about but how often are you going to realize the 3.8 seconds 0 to 60 right like yeah no i agree with you um i mean i was driving the xc40 recharge and i forgot how much horsepower that thing makes it's 0 to 100 in under five seconds it's quick mm -hmm. but like how often are you flooring it every single time you can get like does it matter at all? Yeah. Most well, people... and the thing is that Silverado EV work truck will do a four and a half seconds zero to sixty. So yeah, <laughs> like, it's like uh, 
they're all fast these everything is fast like nothing is it's not like i don't know i remember i i keep getting these youtube recommendations for like is it auto blog or or new newsweek auto week or whatever that old guy like from like reviews from the 80s where oh they, they uh, talk about like passing power is really important and they're back then when cars were running zero to 60 times in like 12 plus second range for like a four-door family sedan those cars are so slow that it's unsafe because you can't merge on the highway properly but anything modern is not like i'm really not concerned about power and acceleration anymore i don't know it's just, maybe it's just me but uh no i'm so think, desensitized to it too i think you're right yeah because like, i have two seconds zero to 60 times now like yeah from, like a showroom car like i can go go touch and drive one if i wanted to if i yeah yeah it there's there's nothing that says yeah no i get what you mean all cars are basically fast these days especially yeah, anything even electric. slow cars are fast like that's the thing yeah <laughs> like they what, really are what is considered slow these days like like a base model civic is not slow anymore <laughs> like no yeah it's like the slowest car that you can probably get it's like that nissan micra uh, or like a mirage yeah like zero to 100 it's probably like just around that 10 second so, okay like a mirage is kind of low-key dangerously slow if you ask me like yeah 80 something horsepower and like the most rough three cylinder engine you can imagine. Those yeah. are that is rough, but for the most part, 99% of the market, the cars that people actually buy, uh, they're, they're all reasonably quick now. Yeah, they, they definitely are. No, you're absolutely right. Um, something I really like about this IX M60 is the color contrast that it has on it, it has that kind of gray which every manufacturer has a gray so but trendy love, right now i love the accent though it's like copper, copper. gold yeah it's yeah there's there's a zoom in of the uh, m badge which is like in done in copper rather than the typical you know blue black. Or red or black yeah. colors it's like it's it's a very low key version yeah. of their m badge yeah. um so this is this m60 like the M badge on the back, that's a full M. That's a full fat M. Because it has a means. line on it. <laughs> so so it's, it's not like a X Drive 40 M. Yeah, it's not the uh, M40 or M50. Because that one doesn't yeah. have the full fat M badge. Full fat M badge gets the three slats slash on, on it. Yeah. So that's a full of fat. Quattro GmbH, but one more. <laughs> or AMG. It's you that's how you know a German car is fast, is how many slashes, slashes are behind yes. the badge. Like the RS or or the AMG's got AMG's got three. They're yeah. really wide. <laughs> now, now some guys gotta go to like Home Depot and buy slashes and then put it on the back of his car. Yeah. Or just like scratch it in with a key. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nine eleven. Those aren't that. Those aren't that fast because they have no no slashes. slashes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But the I I do love the the color combination on this. It looks amazing. Uh, but I mean, it, it's typical BMW goodness, right? The the grill doesn't bother me as much now that I'm looking at it longer. I don't know. Maybe I'm actually getting used to the grill. I just had the Alpina XB7, and I thought the grill looked nice. Oh, yeah. Um, no, exactly. X7 was the car that we all laughed at, like, yeah. a year ago. And and now it looks to... And that's what I, I like about BMW's design, is it really challenges the status quo. The status quo is always like, this is hideous. Why would anyone do this? And then the more you look at it, you're like, shit, I kind of like it. Yeah, uh, like, and, this, like the 6 Series. The, the, they've been doing the, this for a while like look back at the e60 m5 man people hated that car back in like 06 and look at it now right like you look at a you look at an e63 from 05 and man that thing looks so dull you're like okay why is this an amg the uh, e60 m5 is like the the one m5 that you can get that's actually affordable because no one wanted that one <laughs> 
No, the one after is even cheaper. The turbo V8s are cheap because really they're cheap because they're they're very unreliable. Well, oh. the V10 is unreliable, but it's exotic and un- unreliable, so it's okay. But the V8 is not even exotic because you can get an M550 and have ninety percent of the same car. Right, right. Um, but yeah, the E60 generation, uh, that was not a love design. And yet, here we are today, and we like it now. I think, I think at least the majority of people would not look at that and be like, this is a weird car. Same with the 7 Series back in like 02. Like that thing was so weird when it rolled mm-hmm. up. One of my classmates, dad had one. And yeah, that thing... I really liked it at the time. I thought that's, this looks so futuristic. Uh, like the LCI version of that one. LCI, LCI is not as wild. They tamed it down with their LCI. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you look back at so many BMW models that were so controversial, and I, I, I don't know about the iX, okay? But to me, the iX is proportionally... It's just awkward. It has a really pig nose, like a really pig body as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Especially that kind of rump back. Yeah, it's better than that one that we talked about recently. Was that the M? Oh, the the yeah, I can't remember the name of it, but I know what you mean. Yeah, that one is is a little bit much. This one, this one just looks like a minivan to me. I don't think. It has like the sporty flair behind M, uh, or even behind the BMW. The brand. XM is what XM, it's called. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think styling wise this is that exciting. But uh, yeah, no. So there's a few M differences. The suspension is revised as an M car should be. Uh, dual axle air suspension. I'm not sure what that means. I guess. The front has air suspension. Oh, okay. The front and back would have air suspension. Compared to like older X5s, I think, where only the rear had the rear, yeah, I think it air was, suspension yeah. and only the rear would collapse. <laughs> and then they have they talk they they mentioned this a lot in their press releases. The actuator base wheel slip limitation device or or um and what this is is really just how it turns on and off the the front and rear differentials, how it distributes torque. Uh, you know, they're saying, oh, this is way more efficient than a transfer case. Well, you wouldn't have a transfer case with a car that has no drive shafts. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't think that's new for for electric dual motor no, vehicles because it's just. That, isn't that how every all-wheel drive application works? It's I, not just I like, like I like some of the blurb sport. that they put in here. This the particular lightweight, high-tech material already achieved great results in combining engine performance and weight in the BMW M3 CSL, which was introduced back in 2003. So what they're saying is they're using this uh, carbon fiber reinforced plastic that was used in back in 2003. They haven't done much since then, so they're using the same stuff now. Yeah, and it still weighs like <laughs> two and a half tons because it's a big, it's a big boy. Uh, carbon cage, though, that is kind of special about BMWs. Uh, I cars die. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not that big a fan of this car just because I don't think, I don't think it looks cool enough. It doesn't matter what you think. It's a BMW i SUV. It's going to sell like hotcakes. It's going to be one that's going to replace the X5 as their hottest vehicle. <gasps> really? It will. It will. Just you see. This, in this generation? I don't think in this generation. Probably the next one. Yeah. Probably the next one. But like I, I can see a lot of people moving away from their X5 um, to this because... Uh-huh. You know, it's like, oh, electric. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. BMW. The current X5 is such a looker. Too, oh, I, love... I think. <laughs> and I look at this and it's just like an eyesore. <laughs> but like you said, you know, 10 years down the line, you're going to be looking at this. You're like, yes, this is beautiful. Especially uh, with the copper accents. Mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't <laughs> know if I will. Yeah. 
the 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 side window line is very reminiscent of like the first gen x3 so it's very upright and then it has that hoffmeister kink or like a real hoffmeister kink with, yeah, yeah. with the yeah but not that interested in this car i don't know well something that you should be interested in stellantis who <laughs> chrysler um so the makers of two vehicles, the Pacific Pacifica. I forgot the. I was like, "What the hell is the van called again?" The Pacifica <coughs> and the three hundred. They make two cars. Two they still make the three hundred. They still make. You can buy a brand new. Is it coming out in twenty twenty two or is it? Are we leaving that behind in 2021? No, I think you can still get a 2022 300. Oh my god. No, the website only has 2022 Grand Caravan and 2022 Pacifica. Huh. Uh, they have 300 on the website, but it's 2021. Mm, they so just didn't maybe, update it. Maybe they're not bringing it into 2022, hopefully. It, no, there's... there's that yeah. is the definition of beating a dead horse. That is... That is not even last generation. That is like three generations ago, uh, full size sedan. I remember the 300 when it first came out. Um, they were praised at the rear suspension layout because it was taken from the Mercedes E class yeah. from like the mid 2000s. And then like, it's still there. It's t- <laughs> just just a few things. It's fine. It's. Fine. I think it was. I think it was a cool product when it first came out. Like, oh, absolutely. 15, 15 years ago, that thing was sweet. Uh, even in base V6 form, like it still has appeal, mm. curb appeal. Now uh, you drive that and you look like a loser. <laughs> like, well, okay. Uh, not going to lie. I really like the SRT version of the 300. Yeah, as made famous in Breaking Bad of... Breaking Bad has some like pretty fire cars, like like the horses. Aztec. The Aztec. Well, Aztec is the easy one. There's an Aztec tax, like a Breaking Bad tax on Aztecs. Like clearly, these cars where you couldn't give them away, like ten years ago, you couldn't give one away for free. But now, like oh, Aztec, yeah, everyone wants an. Aztec. Everyone wants one now. There's so many people want it that like you can't buy one because they're just so expensive. And there weren't that many to begin with. Um, no one bought them. <laughs> That's so yeah. garbage. So <clears throat> this is the Chrysler Airflow concept. Um, it is a concept, which means that it's not a production-ready vehicle, right? So Chrysler wants to be fully electric by 2028. This Airflow should be in showrooms by 2025. Uh, two electrical motors, 260 horsepower each. Oh, no, sorry. 201 horsepower each. Looking at the wrong thing. Estimated range, 350 to 400 miles. I mean, pretty typical stuff here. Nothing really to be like gawking or whatever at. It, they're so behind. They, <laughs> they're, they are, they're launching this 2025, but the numbers are like not even great for 2021. Yeah, they're 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 pretty current numbers. Um, looking at it though, like it has that SUV type presence because yeah. it looks higher than it should, but it's also a slant back, which means it kind of looks coopy or like it looks very low because there's zero wheel gap. Yeah, uh, that could just be a concept thing, um, but no, Stellantis they are. I would not be investing my money in Stellantis. Uh, let's just put it that way. I think they, they're they kind of, I don't know, their focus is really putting Hellcat motors in everything. They will try to Hellcat swap this airflow. If you let the wrong let it into the wrong hands at SRT, they will try to Hellcat swap it. Um, I think that'd be cool. I, I would appreciate that. <laughs> Looking at this picture, like there's people standing to the right of it no one is taller than the vehicle. Mm, There's a big boy. It's, it, this is going to be a large vehicle. But it doesn't look big. It's like the Ionic 5, you know? The, okay, the Ionic 5 is big-ish. But it's still only like RAV4 size. 
So it's, no. it's not that this is this is big. No, the Ionic Five, the wheelbase is like Palisade. Uh, the Ionic Five is the overall. The overall, overall like, like this is not. It's like Santa like a Fish. Tucson, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But like it, yeah. Um. Okay, so Chrysler, of course, they're they're very behind on this whole EV thing because their main focus was on, you know, like like you said, Hellcat swapping everything. Uh, they they essentially have put that six point two liter V eight supercharged on every single vehicle other than the Pacifica so far and the three hundred. Well, I mean, they put in the Charger, which is basically the same thing. <laughs> right? But, like, this is a... Like, it, it looks good on paper. I'm not going to lie. Um, Stellantis FCA, they, they know how to make a luxurious vehicle. Um, instead, in my latest Jeep review, I, I love the interior of it. It looks really good. And we can see a lot of that influence in here. Like, the screen on the passenger side, it's the exact same one that's in the... Uh, the, the Grand Wagoneer and the Wagoneer. Hmm. Like, you know, there's a lot of that information in here. But this, to me, it looks like a sedan, but it's not. It's kind of like that Polestar 2 feel to hmm. me. And I don't know about you. I don't think the Polestar 2 is, you know, is that great? Because if you're wanting an SUV, just get an SUV. Why well, get something that looks... I don't know. Okay, the Polestar to me has that Saab appeal, right? Uh, the uh, the Saab ninety nine, the Saab nine hundred, which are kind of like coupe sedan things that you know it's 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 its own thing, but it's it's meant to compete with the three, not the Y. Um, but it's this, so tall. This is more of an SUV. Uh, the, the airflow are very crossover y at least, but the renderings only show it with a four seater configuration, yeah. Yeah, but there is a hatchback like a, like a pretty decent sized hatchback, it looks like a decent sized vehicle. Styling wise, I can see some of that Chrysler design element from the Pacifica, from the 200, not so much from the 300. Um, it's it's not a bad design and you know it's every every ev looks the same right they're, they're not making them like boxy like the hummers they're generally all turtle shaped cars um just because it's the most aerodynamic shape is a turtle uh apparently but this is just one of many and i don't know how they're gonna stand out when ford and gm are so much further ahead of them in the ev game yeah. <laughs> because this is aimed for 2025 so let's say let's say it comes out halfway through 2024 there this thing is still only like mach e competitive which mach e at that point will be a five-year-old model and we'll have whatever version of what ford's making then that's not <laughs> so, gonna be updates so yeah and and gm is is making big strides this year and uh you know at the same show, CES, um, yeah, we're seeing big, big news from GM. I this is this is not a big enough move. Uh, Chrysler is. I don't know if. Yeah, I don't know how much longer the Chrysler brand is gonna remain. Chrysler for. I don't know. I think I think for a few decades was kind of like like you'd be proud to own a Chrysler but damn <laughs> no that, that was a long time ago that was a long time ago yeah it was kind of like like oh that's that's a little bit nicer than a Chevy like oh the, yeah so what I actually I'm not focused too much about this car because the airflow sure great it's, car it's just for a 2025 and, yeah. um what I am taken away from is they want to go full electric by 2028. I'm curious what their van would be like. You know, the like a, a big part of the business is per, the Pacifica and the Grand Caravan and whatnot. Yeah. I don't think they're going to completely kill it off when EV comes around. 
you well, know. van just makes sense. Like an EV van, yeah. the form factor I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Because you can just build on top of it's just a box on wheels, right? Yeah. Like so you have your batteries and then you just build your box yeah. over it. It's not gonna be as aerodynamic as typical EV crossovers, but I, it doesn't have to be. I see the van being huge. Like it's not gonna have stow and go because there's no place for it to stow the seats down mm-hmm. when when the batteries are there. Maybe they can do stow and go for the third row because they don't need batteries all the way to the back. Uh, but the second row stow and go is going to be gone. But a van EV, it like if anyone's going to make a good EV van, it's going to be Stellantis. They already make a decent one. Yeah, the plug-in hybrid's not bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, a friend of mine has one and he he loves it, but he also knows that you know he has to visit the dealership every so often <laughs> with you know small problems. But he's like that's that's the you know part of the experience. He actually swapped a uh, SRT wheels on it. It looks really really good. Uh, like I I love the Pacifica. I think it's one of the best vans you can get for the money right now. But like a pure EV. Not just the plug-in hybrid 50 kilometer range, you know, that we currently have, but a pure EV, you know, Chrysler minivan with you know what everything Chrysler, you know, is doing to their vehicles. I think that's gonna be like a really, really compelling product. Yeah. I, I guess the thing is the airflow, okay. The the takeaway from the airflow is that this is moving Chrysler back towards luxury is maybe the the takeaway like you look at the the finer details they have like a crystal shifter looking thing the headlights look jeweled overall this is like a higher end product and i think that makes sense for chrysler's direction Mm -hmm. uh i think the 300 is is such a laughable attempt at luxury it's Um, old man luxury right yeah and it's like you 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 won't really fool anyone because you get into a ram and you're like okay this is a lot more luxurious so you're not even fooling like the typical old man because they they are aware pickup trucks exist and they will get in those and then you you'll notice like a huge difference going into any jeep product any ram product it's already nicer than that um chrysler i think they were just kind of make like cheap to build vehicles for a long time. Uh, the caravan, they dragged that on the previous generation. They dragged that on for such a long time. And, you know, it, it was decent when it came out. It was decent for a long time. But they they kind of got to split up the brands a bit better. That way Chrysler has to be the luxury product. That's why we have the Charger and the 300. The 300 is now... Sh- crap and <laughs> and the uh the charger is still okay because it was always meant to be a plasticky big box on wheels uh but the the, the 300 is no longer luxurious and so what's weird is charger got updates along the way the 300 mm-hmm. never really got it 300 updates. is still in 2011 like you look at the inside and it's still it's still very 20 2011 inside. i mean Yes, the charger was really bad when it first came out. Yeah. Um, and the 300 was better, but the Chrysler really never got the updates that the charger got. Yeah. And it's, but, uh, yeah, the charger actually is okay. I, at one point, I did consider picking one up just to mess around with people with the fake, fake, uh, cop car look. Yeah. Oh, that look. I remember I picked up a charger. With the, a Hemi V8, and the first thing I wanted to do was a burnout. Oh yeah, that's, yeah, it's just... what they're best at doing. <laughs> it was, it was instinctive. Like, huh? I got a charger with a V8. I gotta press both pedals at the same time. And it will do it. It won't freak out oh, at you. It won't it was, like. <laughs> it was super easy. It won't take a screenshot. It won't like. <laughs> <laughs> No, because I, I think I think in my RAV4, if I do that, it will go, you tried to 
step on both pedals at the same time like stop what you're doing <laughs> like <laughs> yeah no. actually a lot of vehicles do that i think mazda yeah. does that too it's like hey did you know you have your foot on both the brake and the accelerator yes <laughs> I'm it's like trying. yes i'm trying to do something cool here <laughs> speaking of something cool sony so sony of course manufacturer of a lot of electronic products um they are making cars. They're going to be making cars with the Trying to. brand. Well, they're going to with they this. Will, they will debut them in the Sony store. <laughs> Ouch. Sony stores are... <laughs> I think the only Sony store you can still find yourself is like the outlet ones. I don't think they even have... Outlets. The outlet ones are gone as well. Because yeah. there was real, like, actual Sony stores and, like, you know, yeah. malls and whatnot. I remember... When the PS2 came out, Dude, Sony it was such stores a cool had. place to go to. Yeah, so many nice TVs. I remember the first OLED um, TV was on sale there, and it was super expensive. Yeah. Anyways, they they're going to be making a car. Um, not the first tech company to make a car. Of course, Tesla is the biggest tech company, and they're making a car. So, Sony, they are like, hey, well, why, why the heck not? So what they did is they like, they they look like te- they look like Tesla. They're like, what we want is we want this except in Sony format, and then pff, the Vision S O two because it's basically just a pumped up Model Three that has Sony bits and pieces into it. Mm. It's okay. It's it's a little bit more exciting than that. It it doesn't look the greatest. Let, let's talk about that first. The yeah, the, the looks so, are black. even amongst even amongst the turtle looking cars that every EV crossover has to be. It it's not even good looking in that sense. Like it the the headlights are so droopy. Like it looks like a sad Pokemon. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just like a dorky looking car, and it's it's taking kind of the worst elements of Tesla and Lucid, and kind of combining that. I don't know. It's I don't I don't think it's like necessarily an ugly car, but it's definitely not attractive. And it's like you're doing your own thing, but what is really making you stand out, right? Like this is this is Betamax, <laughs> if you know what Betamax is. <laughs> <laughs> so the okay here's what i like about the looks yes it's bland it looks like a turtle car like all evs do um but the front headlight like the daytime running light goes all the way across the front grill i like that <laughs> same thing with the tail lights they go all the way across the rear has that kind of aston martin porsche panamera vibe on the back because of that i like that mm-hmm. It, it saves the overall look a little bit. There's a glass ceiling. Everything is glass on top. Like, I think, you know, yes, it's bland, but I don't think it's that bad. The thing is, they had the Vision S01, which is their kind of mule for testing their vehicles. And that was a sedan. And I thought that looked pretty good. It actually won a bunch of Red Dot Design Awards. When they try to make an SUV, a seven-passenger SUV here, and that has stretched things out, it just doesn't look the greatest. There's just something about it that makes it less attractive. But yeah. the inside, the interior, wow, the inside. This is, you know, this is how you know that it is a Sony product, right? You know, the screens that's on there, the just the way that you, you know, interact with the vehicle itself, amazing. Like Sony knows that part, like that's that's their entire digital lineup, right? It's it's absolutely beautiful on the inside. The seats are they look super like cushy and soft. There's screens everywhere. There's like this three screen layout in the center of the dash. I really like that over overhead console too. Like yeah, it's just kind of its own thing, like a UFO thing on top. Yeah, like it looks like a Sony you know, stereo that you would buy back in the day, like the CD players, mm. uh, just something that kind of stands out. Like it's got a look 
good. Not, I, I don't know if uh, the, the current generation is really uh, up to date with Sony. Well, not up to date, but like that familiar with Sony. But Sony used to make like really good looking stuff. Like this is before Apple's time. Before like the iPhone and all this, mm-hmm. Sony would make like their, their Vio laptops and they're all like just very aesthetic, like not necessarily like the best performing or anything like that, but mm-hmm. they have like some pretty, pretty unique design choices that, that kind of made them like higher end in a sense. Um, but I think ever since Apple, uh, people kind of forgot about Sony. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're, you're not wrong. Cause like, I remember when they had when they moved away from MDs into MP3 players. Everyone loved Sony MP3 players because mm-hmm. they had like the little ones, and there were different colors. Yeah. And they had um, the Walkman phones. Yeah, they I had one of those. So Sony W810, <laughs> W810, 850, 900. Yeah. yeah, like this is. I I think this is actually quite pretty on the inside. But yeah. to me, that's what matters, right? I talked about this before. When I'm in, like, when I buy a vehicle, I guess the outside matters. I, I want people to, you know, see the outside. Be like, oh, that's a pretty nice looking car. Maybe give it some nice wheels and tires, thanks to overdrive. But the inside, where I'm going to be, I want that to look good. I want that to be functional. I want the textures and everything to be you know, just a, a more comfortable place to be in. And yeah. this this looks like it fits that. Yeah, even the UI looks cool. Uh, it looks promising, I think. Like, the, I, I don't know if you remember when PS3 came out, I was like, I was so enamored by their UI on PSP and PS3. Like a little, mm. doot, 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 and then you go up and down, like, it was so cool and it, it yeah. wasn't like hard to use or anything it's just like it was it was its own thing mm-hmm. and like sony sony always tries to do their own thing uh at times they kind of rest on their laurels which is not so good um but yeah i i don't know how this is marketable because making a car is not like making electronics <laughs> it's not like you can just like contract it out to Best Buy, let them market it for you, sell sell them and handle the pricing and whatnot. The margins aren't there and the the warranty servicing, like everything is is I don't I don't know how they can fathom making a car, but yeah. I mean they're they're doing it. They're trademarking the Sony Motors mm-hmm. uh incorporated later this year. Like, yeah, it's but then happen. again, everyone is doing it, right? Like, Lucid, these cars, these car companies are kind of just coming out of thin air, and yeah. and they're 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 challenging again that status quo where, you know, Rivian or whatever. Then that's basically how Tesla started is just out of nowhere. We're struggle for a decade and then make something really marketable. Yeah. Um, I I, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to watch because we see so many quote unquote startups, but obviously Sony is one of the most established brands and it's a household name. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if that really gives an advantage because I don't see, I, I just don't see people like going out and like, you know what, I'm going to buy the Sony, Sony car uh, rather than going into Toyota or Honda to buy a car. It just, it's it's such a big purchase that you don't do it so willy nilly. Like I don't just walk into a Sony store and pick up a phone. Uh, it's it's just it's a bizarre concept. I'm just I don't know how this is all going to be executed. I I don't even know what Sony makes these days aside from PS fives. They they still make a lot of good products. Like all their cameras are really good. They're right. kind of top tier cameras. Uh, they do make cell phones. Uh, one of the latest cell phones has basically a you know one of their camera modules in it. Like they they still make a lot of good stuff, um, and they do a lot of behind the scenes stuff too, right? So like a lot of dash cams, the the camera modules and those mm, are the Sony sensors. sensors. Yeah. 
right? They do a lot of back end stuff. Um, like all Nikon cameras, all the sensors are Sony. Right. So like Sony still does a lot of stuff for other people. So like I I'm yeah, curious. I feel like it, like a business model that they could do is just you know partner up with someone that does have a dealer network like a Nissan or something and tell them well, hey, you build think... our cars for us. Well that's the thing. You would think you know Sony and Nissan would do something because you know the GTR has polyphony digital uh you know the the dash display thing. Mm-hmm. It's made by the same guys that did the uh, the Gran Turismo series. You don't think that there's some sort of connection there. You know, they talked about something. Mm-hmm. But it's curious, you know. Yeah, it's uh, like smart when they came out. It's just like, okay, well, let's... Well, that was a Mercedes project mm-hmm. to begin with. So then it obviously makes sense to just roll it out into Mercedes. You'll ship very different product than anything else in the showroom. But somehow kind of made it work yeah. uh, you know mini is another one of these standout brands that again it's an it's an iconic brand but they they went a different direction they, they made their own dealerships um but yeah I, I i don't know how like that just seems like such an uphill battle to make a car company, <laughs> I, I just don't. I just don't get it. It's not going to be easy for them, especially with everything that's coming. And especially coming. with a face only a mother could love. <laughs> like there, there's some really, there's some really good cars coming. Like the Fisker that we talked about a few weeks ago. Hmm. Like it, it's going to be super competitive segment. But what I feel like Sony is going to have down is their interface Mm. like you know when you get into this it's going to work you know it's going to work everything it's just smooth because that's you know all sony's always been up for i'm just curious if they're like because like in their tv lineup xbr has always been like the top trim i wonder if there's going to be like an xbr version of this car so it's the bravia like yeah (laughs) something like yeah no, I, I I get it. I get it. I don't know if this concept is is really the one I would bank on to take on the, the rest of the EV market. But I, I I guess I guess the more I think about it, Sony, they they if if anyone can pull it off, they have a chance. Apple could pull it off. I could I could see. I could see myself driving an Apple car before a Sony car, to be honest. I, I don't know. I'm not a fanboy of either, but yeah. I just love that interior. It's so pretty. <laughs> Size wise, okay, so this is a three row uh three row crossover. Yeah. But row. it's it's pretty small. It's only 193 inches. So it's well, it's not small, but it's like it's the length of a Camry or an Accord. Um, it's wide, though, 76 inches wide. Uh, double wishbone front, air suspension rear. Um, it's it's pretty, like, to today's spec. Uh, because it's an EV, 6.2 inches of ground clearance only, which is, like, you will, in some urban urban environments you can damage the underbody of that at 6.2 inches but maybe that's what the rear air suspension is for just get you over that hump but uh no i think design wise i want to see a bit more like okay it doesn't have to look that pretty but at least push the boundaries Mm -hmm. a bit yeah yeah no i agree it's just it's kind of bland yeah. There's, Whereas like there's... Polestar is like is like okay, that has a look. Like any Volvo product that has like a look. Like that is an iconic product. Yeah. yeah. It it's definitely some it's definitely bland, but there are some cooler like styling elements I do like. But overall it is relatively still a bland vehicle. Um Yeah, I think that's really it. Yeah. 
I think that's really it for the, the first podcast of the new year. Anything else that you want to add? Uh, recall news. I don't know if you guys saw some recall news. Tesla, whenever Tesla does a recall, I think it's it, it somehow everyone like talks about it. And it's like, well, what are you surprised about? So I think the Model 3, they have some kind of harness issue. Uh, that's going to be a lot of fun because replacing the trunk harness, uh, it's just not that accessible so apparently there's like a fire risk and oh the other thing was while we were on our break they updated the ux or the ui of that model 3 and well and other tesla products and people hate it like people are like i'm gonna return i'm gonna like sell this and get another car and you can't backdate it and like people are so upset about that I think I saw that, like the uh, the bottom, how you can't have the uh, the, the defrost. defrost. Yeah, like people are like, it's so dangerous. I need to go into another menu now. Like, no, just do it while you're parked. Again, climate control, climate control woes. I do not sympathize for. We talked about this before. Every journalist calls it out. They're like, this is so hard to use. Blah blah blah. It's like, no, it's not that hard to use and. I bet there's probably even voice command for defrost. Uh, I'm sure there is. Even, even my Fiesta actually had defrost voice command, believe it or not. <laughs> and it actually worked like okay. Your, um, your Fiesta probably couldn't hear you over that exhaust. Yeah, <laughs> probably not, especially with the motor mount. Um, but yeah, no, that was kind of the big EV news over our little break. Uh, yeah, I don't think I again, I think people are just like really sensational about Teslas. And so any <laughs> any news is like there you can't please everyone. I'm sure there's a reason they did the update. I'm sure there's benefits from the update, but the general consensus is we don't like it. And too bad. That's what you get because you own a Tesla. So yeah. yeah. Well- it's the same thing with any software company, right? They make an update. You don't like it? Too bad. You can't. Yeah. A lot of times, you can't go back on it. Yeah, like same Windows thing, like, will change Windows, things. Mac, yeah. Android, any any iOS. Everyone does this, but it's just you've never really seen it before in a car where the defrost button is no longer where you wanted it. It's it's kind of a different world we're living in now. But I don't think yeah, like it. It's not such a deal breaker and people are making it seem like it is yeah yeah no totally agree but i think that's really it for this week yeah awesome catch you next week we'll see you next week and we'll go back on our weekly schedule here to more automotive news and we'll catch you then take care everyone see ya